Walking down again toward the river and looking in the faces of people, I met a young Quaker man whose countenance I liked and accosting him requested he would tell me where a stranger could get lodging. We were then near the sign of the three mariners. Here, says he, is one place that entertains strangers, but is not a reputable house. If thee wilt, walk with me. I'll show thee a better. He brought me to the crooked billet. Here I got a dinner. After dinner my sleeplessness returned, and having been shown to a bed I lay down without undressing, and slept till six in the evening, was called to supper, went to bed again very early, and slept soundly till next morning. Then I made myself as tidy as I could, and went to Andrew Bradford the printer's. I found in the shop the old man, his father, whom I had seen in New York, and who, traveling on horseback, had got to Philadelphia before me. He introduced me to his son, who received me civilly, gave me a breakfast, but told me he did not at present want a hand, being lately supplied with one. But there was another printer in town, lately set up, one Keimer, who perhaps might employ me, if not I should be welcome to lodge at his house, and he would give me a little work to do now and then until further business should offer. The older gentleman said he would go with me to the new printer, and when we found him, Neighbor, says Bradford, I have brought to see you a young man of your business. Perhaps you may want such a one. He asked me a few questions, put a composing stick in my hand to see how I worked, and then said he would employ me soon, though he had then nothing for me to do, and, taking old Bradford, whom he had never seen before, to be one of the townspeople that had good will for him, entered into a conversation on his present undertaking and projects, while Bradford, not discovering that he was the other printer's father, on Keimer's saying he expected soon to get the greatest part of the business into his own hands, drew him on by artful questions, and starting little doubts to explain all his views, what interests he relied on, and in what manner he intended to proceed. I, who stood by and heard all, saw immediately that one of them was a crafty old sophister, and the other a mere novice. Bradford left me with Keimer, who was greatly surprised when I told him who the man was. Keimer's printing house, I found, consisted of an old shattered press and one small, worn-out font of English, which he was then using himself, composing an elegy on Aquila Rose, before mentioned, an ingenious young man of excellent character, much respected in the town, clerk of the assembly, and a pretty poet. Keimer made verses too, but very indifferently. He could not be said to write them, for his manner was to compose them in the types directly out of his head. So, there being no copy but one pair of cases, and the elegy likely to require all the letter, no one could help him. I endeavored to put his press, which he had not yet used, and of which he understood nothing, into order fit to be worked with, and, promising to come and print off his elegy as soon as he should have got it ready, I returned to Bradford's, who gave me a little job to do for the present. A few days after, Keimer sent for me to print off the elegy, and now he got another pair of cases, and a pamphlet to reprint, on which he set me to work. These two printers I found poorly qualified for their business. Bradford had not been bred to it, and was very illiterate, and Keimer, though something of a scholar, was a mere compositor, knowing nothing of press work. He had been one of the French prophets, and could act their enthusiastic agitations. At this time he did not profess any particular religion, was very ignorant of the world, and had, I afterward found, a good deal of the knave in his composition. He did not like my lodging at Bradford's while I worked with him. He had a house, indeed, but without furniture, so he could not lodge me. But he got me a lodging at Mr. Reed's, before mentioned, who was the owner of his house, and, my chest and clothes come by this time, I had made a rather more respectable appearance in the eyes of Miss Reed than I had done when she first happened to see me eating my roll in the street. I began now to have some acquaintance among the young people of the town, with whom I spent my evenings very pleasantly, and gaining money, I lived very agreeably, forgetting Boston as much as I could, and not desiring that any there should know where I resided, except my friend Collins, who was in my secret, and kept it when I wrote to him.
At length, an incident happened that sent me back again much sooner than I had intended. I had a brother-in-law, Robert Holmes, a master of a sloop that traded between Boston and Delaware. He, being at Newcastle, forty miles below Philadelphia, heard there of me, and wrote me a letter mentioning the concern of my friends in Boston at my abrupt departure, assuring me of their good will to me, and that everything would be accommodated to my mind if I would return, to which he exhorted me very earnestly. I wrote an answer to his letter, thanked him for his advice, but stated my reasons for quitting Boston fully and in such a light as to convince him I was not so wrong as he had apprehended. Sir William Keith, governor of the province, was then at Newcastle, and Captain Holmes, happening to be in company with him when my letter came to hand, spoke to him of me and showed him the letter. The governor read it and seemed surprised. He said, I appeared a young man of promising parts, and therefore should be encouraged. The printers at Philadelphia were wretched ones. For his part, he would procure me the public business, and do me every other service in his power. This my brother-in-law afterwards told me in Boston, but I knew as yet nothing of it. One day, Keimer and I being at work together near the window, we saw the governor and another gentleman, which proved to be Colonel French of Newcastle, finely dressed, come directly across the street to our house, and heard them at the door. Keimer ran down immediately, thinking it a visit to him, but the governor inquired for me, came up, and with a condescension of politeness I had been quite unused to, made me many compliments, desired to be acquainted with me, blamed me kindly for not having made myself known to him when I first came to the place, and would have me away with him to the tavern, where he was going with Colonel French to taste, as he said, some excellent Madeira. I was not a little surprised. I went, however, with the governor and Colonel French to a tavern, at the corner of Third Street, and over the Madeira he proposed my setting up my business, laid before me the probabilities of success, and both he and Colonel French assured me I should have their interest and influence in procuring the public business of both governments. On my doubting whether my father would assist me in it, Sir William said he would give me a letter to him, in which he would state the advantages, and he did not doubt of prevailing with him. So it was concluded I should return to Boston in the first vessel, with the governor's letter recommending me to my father. In the meantime the intention was to be kept a secret, and I went on working with Keimer as usual, the governor sending for me now and then to dine with him, a very great honor, I thought it, and conversing with me in the most affable, familiar, and friendly manner imaginable. About the end of April, 1724, a little vessel offered for Boston. I took leave of Keimer as going to see my friends. The governor gave me an ample letter, saying many flattering things of me to my father, and strongly recommending the project of my setting up at Philadelphia as a thing that must make my fortune. We struck on a shoal in going down the bay and sprung a leak. We had a blustering time at sea and were obliged to pump almost continually, at which I took my turn. We arrived safe, however, at Boston in about a fortnight. I had been absent seven months, and my friends had heard nothing of me. Holmes was not yet returned, and had not written about me. My unexpected appearance surprised the family. All were, however, very glad to see me, and made me welcome, except my brother. I went to see him at his printing house, I was better dressed than ever while in his service, having a genteel new suit from head to foot, a watch, and my pockets lined with near five pounds sterling in silver. He received me not very frankly, looked me all over, and turned to his work again. The journeymen were inquisitive where I had been, what sort of country it was, and how I liked it. I praised it much, the happy life I led in it, expressing strongly my intention of returning to it, and one of them asking what kind of money we had there. I produced a handful of silver and spread it before them, which was kind of a rare show they had not been used to, paper being the money of Boston. And lastly, my brother still grum and sullen, I gave them a piece of eight to drink and took my leave. This visit of mine offended him extremely, for when my mother some time after spoke to him of reconciliation, and of her wishes to see us on good terms together, and that we might live for the future as brothers, 
He said I had insulted him in such a manner before his people that he could never forget or forgive it. In this, however, he was mistaken. My father received the governor's letter with some apparent surprise, but said little of it to me for some days. When Captain Holmes returning, he showed it to him, asked if he knew Keith, and what kind of man he was, adding his opinion that he must be of small discretion to think of setting a boy up in a business who wanted yet three years of being at man's estate. Holmes said what he could in favor of the project, but my father was clear in his impropriety of it, and at last gave a flat denial to it. Then he wrote a civil letter to Sir William, thanking him for the patronage he had so kindly offered me, but declining to assist me as yet in setting up, I being, in his opinion, too young to be trusted with the management of a business so important, and for which the preparation must be so expensive. My friend and companion Collins, who was a clerk in the post office, pleased with the account I gave him of my new country, determined to go thither also, and while I waited for my father's determination, he set out before me by land to Rhode Island, leaving his books, which were a pretty collection of mathematics and natural philosophy, to come with mine and me to New York, where he proposed to wait for me. My father, though he did not approve Sir William's proposition, was yet pleased that I had been able to obtain so advantageous a character from a person of such note where I had resided, and that I had been so industrious and careful as to equip myself so handsomely in so short of time. Therefore, seeing no prospect of an accommodation between my brother and me, he gave his consent to my returning again to Philadelphia, advised me to behave respectfully to the people there, endeavor to obtain the general esteem and avoid lampooning and libeling, to which he thought I had too much inclination, telling me that, by steady industry and a prudent parsimony, I might save enough by the time I was one and twenty to set me up, and that, if I came near the matter, he would help me out with the rest. This was all I could obtain, except some small gifts as tokens of his and my mother's love, when I embarked again for New York, now with their approbation and their blessing. The sloop putting in at Rhode Island, I visited my brother John, who had been married and settled there some years. He received me very affectionately, for he'd always loved me. A friend of his, one Vernon, having some money due to him in Pennsylvania, about thirty-five pounds currency, desired I would receive it for him and keep it till I had his directions what to remit it in. Accordingly, he gave me an order. This afterwards occasioned me a good deal of uneasiness. At Newport we took in a number of passengers for New York, among which there were two young women, companions, and a grave, sensible, matron-like Quaker woman with her attendants. I had shown an obliging readiness to do her some little services, which impressed her, I suppose, with a degree of good will toward me. Therefore, when she saw a daily growing familiarity between me and the two young women, which they appeared to encourage, she took me aside and said, Young man, I am concerned for thee, as thou hast no friend with thee, and seems not to know much of the world, or of the snares youth is exposed to. Those are very bad women. I can see it in all their actions, and if thee art not upon thy guard, they will draw thee into some danger. They are strangers to thee, and I advise thee in a friendly concern for thy welfare to have no acquaintance with them. As I seemed at first not to think so ill of them as she did, she mentioned some things she had observed and heard that had escaped my notice. I thanked her for her kind advice and promised to follow it. When we arrived at New York, they told me where they lived and invited me to come see them, but I avoided it. And it was well that I did, for the next day the captain missed a silver spoon and some other things that had been taken out of his cabin. And, knowing that these were a couple of strumpets, he got a warrant to search their lodgings, found the stolen goods, and had the thieves punished. So though we had escaped a sunken rock, which we scraped upon in passage, I thought this escape of rather more importance to me. At New York I found my friend Collins, who had arrived there some time before me. We had been intimate from children, and had read the same books together. But he had the advantage of more time for reading and studying, and a wonderful genius for mathematical learning, in which he far outstripped me. 
while I lived in Boston, most of my hours of leisure for conversation were spent with him, and he continued a sober as well as an industrious lad, was much respected for his learning by several of the clergy and other gentlemen, and seemed to promise making a good figure in life. But during my absence he had acquired a habit of sotting with brandy, and I found by his own account and what I heard from others that he had been drunk every day since his arrival at New York and behaved very oddly. He had gamed too and lost his money, so that I was obliged to discharge his lodgings and defray his expenses to and at Philadelphia, which proved extremely inconvenient to me. The then governor of New York, Burnett, son of Bishop Burnett, hearing from the captain that a young man, one of his passengers, had a great many books, desired he would bring me to see him. I waited upon him accordingly, and should have taken Collins with me, but that he was not sober. The governor treated me with great civility, showed me his library, which was a very large one, and we had a good deal of conversation about books and authors. This was the second governor who had done me the honor of taking notice of me, which, to a poor boy like me, was very pleasing. We proceeded to Philadelphia. I received on the way Vernon's money, without which we could hardly have finished our journey. Collins wished to be employed in some counting house, but whether they discovered his dramming by his breath or by his behavior, he met with no success in any application, and continued lodging and boarding at the very same house with me and at my expense. Knowing I had that money of Vernon's, he was continually borrowing from me, still promising repayment as soon as he should be in business. At length he had got so much of it that I was distressed to think what I should do in case of being called on to remit it. His drinking continued, about which we sometimes quarreled, for when a little intoxicated he was very fractious. Once, in a boat on the Delaware with some other young men, he refused to row in his turn. I will be rowed home, says he. We will not row you, says I. You must or stay the night on the water, says he, just as you please. The others said, Let us row. What signifies it? But my mind being soured on his other conduct, I continued to refuse, so he swore he would make me row or throw me overboard, stepping on the thwarts toward me, when he came up and struck at me. I clapped my hand under his crutch and rising pitched him head foremost into the river. I knew he was a good swimmer, but before he could get round to lay hold of the boat, we had with a few strokes pulled her out of his reach, and ever when he drew near the boat, we asked if he would row, striking a few strokes to slide her away from him. He was ready to die with vexation, and obstinately would not promise to row. However, seeing him at last beginning to tire, we lifted him in and brought him home in the evening. We hardly exchanged a civil word afterwards, and a West India captain, who had a commission to procure a tutor for the sons of a gentleman at Barbados, agreed to carry him thither. He left me then, promising to remit me the first money he should receive in order to discharge the debt, but I never heard of him after. The breaking into this money of Vernon's was the first of the great errata of my life, and this affair showed that my father was not much out of his judgment when he supposed me too young to manage business of importance. But Sir William, on reading his letter, said he was too prudent. There was a great difference in persons, and discretion did not always accompany years, nor was youth always without it. And since he will not set you up, says he, I will do it myself. Give me an inventory of the things necessary to be had from England, and I will send for them. You shall repay me when you are able. I am resolved to have a good printer here, and I am sure you must succeed. I had hitherto kept the position of my setting up a secret in Philadelphia, and I still kept it. Had it been known that I depended on the governor, probably some friend that knew him better, would have advised me not to rely on him, as I afterwards heard it as his known character to be liberal of promises which he never meant to keep. Yet, unsolicited as he was by me, how could I think his generous offers insincere? I believed him one of the best men in the world. I presented him an inventory of a little printing house, accounting by my computation to be about one hundred pounds sterling. He liked it, but asked me if my being on the spot in England to choose the types, and see that everything was good of the kind, might not be of some advantage. Then, says he, 
When there, you may make acquaintances and establish correspondences in the bookselling and stationary way. I agreed that this might be advantageous. Then, says he, get yourself ready to go with Annis, which was the annual ship, and the only one at the time usually passing between London and Philadelphia. But it would be some months before Annis sailed, so I continued working with Keimer, fretting about the money Collins had got from me, and in daily apprehensions of being called upon by Vernon, which, however, did not happen for some years after. I believe I have omitted mentioning that, in my first voyage from Boston, our people set about catching cod and hauled up a great many. Hitherto I had stuck to my resolution of not eating animal food, and on this occasion considered it the taking every fish as a kind of unprovoked murder, since none of them had or ever could do us any injury that might justify the slaughter. All this seemed very reasonable, but I had formerly been a great lover of fish, and, when this came hot out of the frying pan, it smelled admirably well. I balanced some time between principle and inclination, till I recollected that, when the fish were open, I saw smaller fish taken out of their stomachs, then thought I, if you eat one another, I don't see why we mayn't eat you. So I dined upon cod, and continued to eat with other people, returning only now and then, occasionally, to a vegetable diet. So convenient a thing it is to be a reasonable creature, since it enables one to find or make a reason for everything one has a mind to do. Keimer and I lived on a pretty good familiar footing, and agreed tolerably well, for he suspected nothing of my setting up. He retained a great deal of his old enthusiasms, and loved argumentation. We therefore had many disputations. I used to work him so with my Socratic method, and had trepanned him so often by questions apparently so distant from any point we had in hand, and yet by degrees led to a point, that at last he grew ridiculously cautious, and would hardly answer me the most common question, without asking first, What do you intend to infer from that? However, it gave him so high an opinion of my abilities in the confuting way, that he seriously proposed my being his colleague in a project he had of setting up a new sect. He was to preach the doctrines, and I was to confound all opponents. When he came to explain with me upon the doctrines, I found several conundrums which I objected to, unless I might have my way a little too, and introduce some of mine. Keimer wore his beard at full length, because somewhere in the Mosaic Law it said, Thou shalt not mar the corners of thy beard. He likewise kept the seventh day, Sabbath, and these two points were essential with him. I disliked both, but agreed to admit them upon condition of his adopting the doctrine of using no animal food. I doubt, he said, my constitution will not bear that. I assured him it would, and that he would be the better for it. He was usually a great glutton, and I promised myself some diversion in half-starving him. He agreed if I would keep him company. I did so, and we held it for three months. We had our victuals dressed and brought to us regularly by a woman in the neighborhood, who had from me a list of forty dishes to be prepared for us at different times, in all which there was neither fish, flesh, nor fowl, and the whim suited me the better at this time from the cheapness of it. I have since kept several lents most strictly, leaving the common diet for that, and that for the common abruptly, without the least inconvenience so that I think there is little in the advice of making those changes by easy gradations. I went on pleasantly, but poor Keimer suffered grievously, longed for the flesh pots of Egypt, and ordered a roast pig. He invited me and two women friends to dine with him, but it being brought too soon upon the table, he could not resist the temptation, and ate the whole before we came. I had made some courtship during this time to Miss Reed. I had a great respect and affection for her, and had some reason to believe she had the same for me. But, as I was about to take a long voyage, and we were both very young, only a little above eighteen, it was thought most prudent by her mother to prevent our going too far at present, as a marriage, if it was to take place, would be more convenient after my return, when I should be, as I expected, set up in my business. Perhaps, too, she thought my expectations not so well founded as I imagined them to be. My chief acquaintances at this time were Charles Osborne, Joseph Watson, and James Ralph, all lovers of reading. 
The two first were clerks to an eminent Shrevener or conveyancer in the town, Charles Brogdon. The other was clerk to a merchant. Watson was a pious, sensible young man of great integrity. The others rather more lax in their principles of religion, particularly Ralph, who, as well as Collins, had been unsettled by me, for which they both made me suffer. Osborne was sensible, candid, frank, sincere, and affectionate to his friends. Ralph was ingenious, genteel in his manners, and extremely eloquent. I think I never knew a prettier talker. Both of them great admirers of poetry, and began to try their hands in little pieces. Many pleasant walks we four had together on Sundays into the woods near Schokel, where we read to one another and conferred on what we read. Ralph was inclined to pursue the study of poetry, not doubting, but he might become eminent in it and make his fortune by it, alleging that the best poets must, when they first began to write, make as many faults as he did. Osborne dissuaded him, assured him he had no genius for poetry, and advised him to think of nothing beyond the business he was bred to, that, in the mercantile way, though he had no stock he might, by his diligence and punctuality, recommend himself to employment as a factor, and in time acquire wherewith to trade on his own account. I approve the amusing oneself with poetry now and then, so far as to improve one's language, but no farther. On this it was proposed that we should, each of us, at our next meeting, produce a piece of our own composing, in order to improve by our mutual observations, criticisms, and corrections. As language and expression were what we had in view, we excluded all considerations of invention by agreeing that the task should be a version of the 18th Psalm, which describes the descent of a deity. When the time of our meeting drew nigh, Ralph called on me first, and let me know his piece was ready. I told him I had been busy, and, having little inclination, had done nothing. He then showed me his piece for my opinion, and I much approved it, as it appeared to me to have great merit. Now, says he, Osborne never will allow the least merit in anything of mine. He is not so jealous of you. I wish, therefore, you would take this piece and produce it as yours. I will pretend not to have had time, and so produce nothing. We shall then see what he will say to it. It was agreed, and I immediately transcribed it that it might appear in my own hand. We met. Watson's performance was read. There were some beauties in it, but many defects. Osborne's was read. It was much better. Ralph did it justice, remarked some faults, but applauded the beauties. He himself had nothing to produce. I was backward, seemed desirous of being excused, had not had sufficient time to correct, etc., but no excuse could be admitted. Produce I must. It was read and repeated. Watson and Osborne gave up the contest and joined in applauding it. Ralph only made some criticisms and proposed some amendments, but I defended my text. Osborne was against Ralph and told him he was no better a critic than poet, so he dropped the argument. As they two went home together, Osborne expressed himself still more strongly in favor of what he thought my production, having restrained himself before, as he said, lest I should think it flattery. But who would have imagined it, said he, that Franklin had been capable of such a performance, such painting, such force, such fire? He has even improved the original. In his common conversation he seems to have no choice of words. He hesitates and blunders, and yet, good God, how he writes. When we next met, Ralph discovered the trick we had played him, and Osborne was a little laughed at.